Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Self-Care Forum podcast. My name is Dr. Cedric Batchatu, your host for the hour. We bring knowledge to empower you and address the root cause of disease. Our goal is to interest you in the care of the human frame, in diet, and in the cause and prevention of disease. Today, we're joined by none other than Dr. Tanya Painter, a naturopathic doctor. As a naturopathic doctor, she left the world of traditional medical care to create an online business and coaching platform for women struggling with chronic migraines. Dr. Painter graduated from the University of Washington with a Bachelor of Science in Cellular and Molecular Biology and a minor in Inorganic Chemistry. She then went to med school, medical school at Bastyr University and received her doctorate in naturopathic medicine in 2012. After graduation, she entered into private practice from 2012 until 2021. Now she runs an online program to help women struggling with chronic migraine who are finding that conventional treatment approaches are not working well and who are looking for a way to heal their body and not just control their symptoms. This change of focus was prompted by her own struggle with chronic headaches and migraines and the amazing changes uh, she discovered around treating migraines with a whole body integrated approach. Dr. Tanya Painter, I want to thank you for joining us here on the Self-Care Forum podcast. Thank you for having me. Yes, thank you for joining us. Uh, I like to start every uh, interview by asking our guest, and I'll do the same with you, uh, to elaborate a little bit on what inspired you uh, to pursue this journey uh, to becoming a naturopathic uh, doctor. Yeah, it all started back in fourth grade uh, when I first had my first health class and I just fell in love with how the body worked. And I knew back then that I wanted to be a doctor. Um, so fast forward to high school, you're figuring out where you're going to apply, uh, or I should say actually post post high school, um, you know, after, when I was going to apply to medical school, um, I, I heard this weird thing called naturopathic medicine and it sounded very intriguing. And so I looked into it a little bit and it was just right up my alley. Um, really, you know, less about medications and treating symptoms and more about trying to figure out what's going on in the body, um, mm -hmm. using the biochemistry that we know about, you know, how our hormones are working and how diet is affecting us and nutrient pathways and all kinds of of things. And, um, that really, that really struck a chord with me. And that was the kind of medicine that I wanted to practice. So, um, so I chose to go a naturopathic medicine route and, um, I couldn't be happier. I absolutely love what I do. And you also mentioned that, um, your own personal experience is what led you to focus specifically on migraines. Can you elaborate on that, please? Yeah. So when I was uh, 16, I was rear-ended in a car accident and that kind of started my journey. Um, I started getting, you know, fairly frequent headaches at that point. Um, and they gradually became more intense and, um, kind of progressed into migraines and, um, to the point where when I was going through, um, you know, college, I was basically having daily headaches and then they would flare into migraines usually by the end of the day after I'd been sitting in class for, you know, four or five hours. And, um, so I struggled with that for a good decade, um, probably a little bit longer than that. And then I went to medical school and, uh, I started to kind of apply what I was learning in classes to myself. I kind of consider myself my first patient and really started understanding how my diet and my stress and my stress management or lack thereof, um, and my sleep and hormones and all of it was playing a, a piece of a bigger picture. And for me, it was manifesting as those daily headaches. I started getting better. And, um, by the end of medical school, I actually left medical school feeling 50 years younger than I did when I entered it. Um, and I felt like I had my life back and I was able to actually go into practice and not feel miserable. And it was just amazing. And so when I was in primary care and, you know, patients with headaches would come in as a major complaint or even a side complaint that like, I loved treating people with headaches because I knew exactly how to help them figure out what was going on and then fix that problem. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I was always very effective at it because it was something I had studied very intently for personal reasons. And that just kind of led me down the path of feeling called to, um, go more specifically to women with migraines, uh, because you know, the, the statistics show 40% of women with chronic migraines 
and, and I, I always quote women because I, that's kind of my area of specialty is, is women. Sure. Um, but, um, you know, 40% of women with chronic migraines, they don't respond to medication. And so then if they don't respond well to meds, like what's left for them. And, um, so then I developed the program that I I'm doing now, um, with some very, very good results. So. Thank you for sharing that. And before we dive into that, and I, I especially want to discuss a little bit about why migraine tends to be more prevalent in women than men. But before we dive into that, uh, for those who may not fully understand what a migraine is, can you elaborate on the differences between migraines and headaches? Because I'm sure we've all experienced headaches, but most of us probably haven't experienced a migraine, fortunately. So what are some differences between a typical headache, which is the pain in your head, and what we consider a migraine? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and there's actually even uh, doctors get, you know, miss the diagnosis often. So I think mm-hmm. it's really a really important question. So uh, the, the actual diagnostic um, criteria for a migraine is that you have um, at least five headache attacks that last between four to 72 hours. Um, they are usually not well treated. Like you can't just take a, an Advil or something for it and have it go away. Mm-hmm. Um, and then they, they also have to have some accompanying symptoms. So they have to be either on just one side of the head or like a pulsating quality, um, severe, like severe debilitating pain, um, uh, of Avoid, you know, uh, aggravated by, you know, smells, sounds, lights, uh, activity, things like that. And then usually accompanied by um, either issues with um, nausea, vomiting, um, you know, activity levels, uh, walking, climbing stairs will aggravate it. Um, so those are some of the, the diagnostic criteria and it can come with or without aura, which, um, basically is just kind of some neurological visual d- disturbances, mm-hmm. um, that's not diagnostic of migraine. They're considered kind of two separate, um, categories, if you will, of migraine with or without aura. Um, and so, but it, it's, it's basically the easy way of thinking about it is if it's just a headache and your head hurts, it's probably just a headache. But if it's like this intense head pain that has nausea and vomiting and you can't look at bright lights or sound is just makes is like a, you know, jackhammer to your skull. Those are, those are migraine symptoms. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, as you stated earlier, 40% of women will experience some sort of migraine at some point in their lives compared to about 18% of men. Um, who will experience migraine. So the majority of migraine sufferers are women. What are some reasons why you think that's the case? Yeah. Yeah. One in three migraine sufferers is women or women are three times higher uh, likelihood than men to have migraines. And there's several different theories about why women, um, you know, it, there is a, currently a theory out there that perhaps uh, migraines are related to an autoimmune condition and autoimmunity, uh, com- you know, hits women much more than men. But if you look at all of those things, whatever it is, to me, it makes the most sense that there's something with our hormones. There's something about estrogen um, and estrogen plays a big role. Well, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, they all play a big role in our immune system and how it works. Mm -hmm. And so there's likely a component of our estrogen and progesterone levels that are contributing to the fact that we have more autoimmune disease. We have much more migraines. And I, you know, I like to tell my clients, if you're a woman and you have migraines, hormones are a piece of that hundred percent, whether they've tested normal or not, hormones are going to be playing a role. So I think my personal theory is that, um, it's, it's a hormone issue. Wow. Wow. Very interesting. Now, as far as other, uh, additional triggers, for example, uh, for these migraines, what besides hormones can cause someone to actually trigger a migraine? So there's a lot of well-known and then there's some lesser well-known. So I'll kind of briefly go over the well-known just in case someone isn't familiar. Um, Mm -hmm. That's things like stress or certain foods, certain inflammatory foods, Um, foods higher in histamine. Um, For example, are one you can see a low histamine or low tyramine are very common migraine diets. Um, In interrupted sleep patterns, things like that are really common. When we're looking at migraines and what triggers them, 
um, it, it really comes down to the individual person. There's not any one thing that triggers for everybody. Weather is a huge trigger for a lot of people, but not everybody has weather triggered migraines. Mm -hmm. And so again, we want to kind of go a little bit deeper, you know, why is, why is weather such a big trigger for a lot of people? Well, that often comes back down to serotonin levels. Um, so serotonin fluctuations, which serotonin is one of our kind of happy, um, kind of stabilizing neurotransmitters. Mm -hmm. And when we, we know that when there are drops in serotonin, that will trigger a migraine for, for a lot of people. That's what triptans work on is the serotonin pathway, boost your serotonin, you feel better. Um, but that might only be the case for a handful of people. That's maybe why 40% of women don't respond well to triptans is because they, it's not mainly a serotonin issue. Maybe it's a hormonal issue or maybe it's a cortisol issue. So some of the things that I like to focus in on is really understanding the patterns behind uh, someone's migraines. Mm -hmm. And that helps us to kind of identify what those triggers for them are. So for example, I hear all the time um, when I wake up, I wake up with one. Um, the time of day that you get one gives us a huge clue as to some of the things we need to focus in on cortisol, mm -hmm which is one of our stress hormones, that is, um, we know that when we have drops in cortisol, that will trigger a migraine. And so when cortisol is at its lowest point through the night, that can be a reason why we wake up with a migraine. Um, right. Serotonin is lowest around three to 4 a.m. So when, you know, when the serotonin levels drop too low, that can be a reason for a migraine. Uh, and, and then there's a couple other things for, you know, waking up with a migraine in the middle of the night, low blood pressure. A lot of times women with chronic migraines actually have really low blood pressure. And they actually, instead of spiking when they're in pain with a migraine, they actually drop which is kind of backwards. We would expect it to increase and it will actually decrease, which tells right. us that there is a piece to, you know, a blood pressure piece. It can also be related to imbalanced blood sugar since our blood sugar will drop as we're fasting and sleeping through the night. Mm -hmm. So we have about 50 different things that we know will trigger a migraine and mm -hmm. the time of day that you get it can actually narrow it down from 50 to five or six. And then we can really focus in, is it blood sugar? Is it blood pressure? Is it the cortisol? Is it serotonin? Let's take a look at some of the other things going along with those migraines to narrow it down even further. And then we know where to start pinpointing our either targeted um, lab work to measure levels of our neurotransmitters or our hormones or, you know, what have you. So that's kind of the systematic way that we kind of come back to figuring out what that problem is for a particular person. And it's work right? It, and it, it takes investigation. It takes figuring out what, you know, those patterns that you're seeing, um, mm -hmm. and then figuring out what that means. And that can be why it can be so tricky to figure out is because there's a lot of time investment, both on the doctor and the patient's part. And unfortunately the way our current medical system is set up, we don't have 45 minutes or an hour to sit down and go over all these different things with our patients. Like it's, right. You, this is your problem. Here's your medication. Like, I hope you feel better. You know, let me know how it goes. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yes. So that's yeah. one of the reasons why I love being able to work um, very closely with, with women to try to figure these things out and to identify those patterns so that we know, okay, these are the major areas we need to focus on for you mm -hmm. and then, and then do it. Sure. Well, when does a migraine become life-threatening when is it serious enough for someone to actually take action because i i can imagine for a lot of people um they would just ignore it if it's not that bad but when would you advise someone who experiences migraines maybe not frequently maybe infrequently but when would you at which point would you advise them to go and see a doctor or maybe even go and see come and see you well you know the if it's an infrequent thing, or if it's a new first time uh, migraine, um, and you don't know what's going on and you have this intense severe pain, like you should absolutely go into the ER because there are, it might not be just a simple migraine. It could be the start of a stroke or, you know, some other major event that's happening. So if, if you have a new headache, um, something that is just starting, you've never experienced before immediate follow-up with care is very appropriate to make sure there's not something else going on that needs to be taken care of. Mm -hmm. If it's something where someone has had migraines for a long time, it's less a matter of being life-threatening. If they've been diagnosed, they have medications for it. They know what to do when it happens. 
then it's more of how often is it, you know, how much impact is it having in their day-to-day life? And the women that I work with, they tend to basically not have a life anymore. They feel so badly all the time, or they never know when it's going to hit that they no longer make plans. They just kind of do their thing in their house. If they are lucky enough to still have a job, they go to work, they come home and that's about all they'll do because they don't want to do anything that's going to trigger another migraine for them. Mm -hmm. And that to me, that quality of life is very, very low at that point. You stop socializing. A lot of times it will, you know, interfere with relationships and family. Um, So that's the point where, you know, most people hopefully before it gets to that point, they're seeking help, but, um, definitely that's when it's going to be important for them to, to know that there's some other options out there if just medications aren't working for them. Well, that's good to know. Um, because I can imagine for most people who are experiencing migraines, they would likely go to a neurologist and what's fairly common is, you know, giving them triptans, uh, such as Imitrex and some of these other medications that will uh, usually deal with the blood flow and everything. Um, so what is actually happening, according to you, what is actually, and your understanding, what is actually happening in the brain uh, during a migraine? Is there something, uh, because it, it sounded to me like there are many different causes, such as blood sugar, um, blood pressure, the time of the day. So how would you how would you explain to, to, to the audience what's actually happening during the migraine as you understand? Yeah. So, you know, again, we know some of the things that go along there, there is, um, a lot of, in a lot of cases, we see the blood vessels of the brain getting bigger. It's called vasodilation that happens that Mm -hmm. puts increased pressure in the brain and that can cause pain. Um, so we know that that's usually uh, a part of it. However, triptans help to cause vasoconstriction. And we know that not everybody responds well to triptans and and that vasoconstriction piece. So it's not always that. Um, there is a kind of a hyperactivity of the pain pathways that happen in somebody with migraines. And so what ends up happening is however that pain is triggered for them, um, then that's when we, we kind of see that, that migraine piece happening. And so when we're looking at, you know, I think of migraines very similarly to something like, um, you know, regional pain syndrome, or, you know, some of those other kind of unexplained neurological um, nerve pain hypersensitivities. And it's, they're all kind of in that same realm of really understanding how somebody's um, hypersensitivity to pain or to stimulus can transfer into pain. Uh, And even something as simple as, um, for example, there is uh, an eye misalignment in about 20% of people with migraines, it will help if they get that eye misalignment taken care of. And this is, um, this is fairly new uh, with new technology within the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. And um, they use prism lenses to help kind of redirect where the eye focuses. Well, interestingly, in these in this 20% of people, Um, it's the strain on the muscles around the eye that then is triggering this hypersensitivity, uh, this pain pathway in the trigeminal nerve, which is the main nerve responsible for pain and sensation in our face. Um, and so just having, you know, the muscle tension in the eyes can actually trigger this hypersensitive pain pathway and then a migraine occurs. So, um, so really it comes down to kind of calming that that overreaction and why that happens. We don't know. Um, hormones definitely play a role. Our neurotransmitter balance plays a role. Inflammation we know plays a role Mm -hmm. and, um, blood sugar level, you know, I mean, there's a lot of things that play a role in why somebody's pain pathways might be hypersensitive. Um, and so then it's a matter of kind of just addressing all of those things, um, together and then helping the body to detox and get rid of all of the things that might be keeping it stirred up, um, checking for any undiagnosed infections like, uh, you know, a herpes virus or a, um, cytomegalovirus or H, um, uh, oh my goodness, Epstein-Barr virus, you know, those kinds of things that can kind of lie dormant, but can flare and that can lead to some of these things too. So there's a lot of, of, um, underlying reasons why we might have that hypersensitivity. Wow. Thank you for that. In your online practice or in your practice, rather, what happens when someone sees you, when someone comes to see you, what is your approach to getting to know them? Because as you stated, 
you know, the conventional medical system gives you about 12, between 12 to 15 minutes to see a doctor. And that's not nearly enough time to really get to know you, get to know what your life is like, get to understand what you're going through. It, it's just not. And so what generally happens is that the consultation ends with you getting a prescription drug. And of course, it's symptomatic and it's great for symptomatic relief. But as you stated, for 40% of women, it, it doesn't seem to do anything. And even for those who are presently taking these things and having some sort of symptomatic relief, that's not the ideal life. Ideally, you want to deal with the root cause of your migraine. So how would you approach a new patient that came to see you? Yeah. So with our program, um, it's kind of a mix between group work and, um, kind of self-paced and individualized. So we have kind of a program where we have basics that everybody, like we know this affects everybody with migraines, the stress, the sleep issues, dietary stuff. So we really work on a lot of those foundational pieces and helping to bring awareness. It, it's crazy. And I know this from personal experience, how much we ignore what our body is telling us. We'll get, we'll get, you know, little, little information that we just ignore because we're busy. We got to do stuff. We don't have time to sit down and we just kind of push that, you know, those things to the back of our mind. It's just, that's life. But if we really start to tune in, we can actually start getting information from our body before we push ourselves into a situation where, you know, a migraine occurs. And, and I'm, and I don't want to say that anything, any person is doing is actually causing the migraine. That's not how I mean it to come out. I just mean that there's a lot of information we can gather from our body to help us do all of those little clues that are there that we've never looked for. We didn't understand were clues and that, and then as they're working on kind of tracking some of that and understanding a little bit more about what's going on from a pattern standpoint, we're there, my team and I are there to help them. So they, they, they can fill out some, you know, journal entries and we're happy to kind of look at it and start picking some things out mm -hmm. and asking them questions. You know, what's your blood pressure first thing in the morning when you get up, I have everybody track blood pressure for a couple of days so that they know what their normal is. And they know what happens when they have a migraine. Is mm -hmm. it, does it spike when they're in pain? Okay. That's pretty, that's pretty normal. That's what we're looking for. Does it drop when they get a migraine? That's not right. I mean, for someone to be in the seventies over fifties, when they have a migraine, we know that there's a big piece that's going on there and then right. we can do yes. stuff about that. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot of those kind of looking for those clues. And then we're there to help kind of direct them when we hear something that's like, Oh, what, what, what did, what did you notice about that? Well, let's take a look at this and here's some questions to answer. And what do you notice? And then as they give us that information, we're building this picture with them to understand more about what's going on. So they're kind of working through the program, their program, the, the 12 week program piece and, and learning more about the physiology behind migraines and how that's applicable to them. And then we're kind of behind the scenes as they're giving us information that they're learning about their bodies and helping them put that together. And so that's how we're able to work together to really you know, get a good idea for each individual client that comes through of what's going on for them. And then of course, we've got resources to help them and all kinds of different herbal options. We've got medication options that while we can't prescribe since, you know, this is a nationwide um, course and we're only licensed in the state of Washington. So we, but we can certainly give them um, options for medications that might work for them. Mm -hmm. But there's also too, a lot of herbs that could work based on what we figure out is going on for their particular situation. Um, so we're able to utilize kind of all the tools that we have available, as long as they have a doctor at home, that's willing to kind of help, help out as well. So, and this is what you can, this is what you call your whole body uh, approach to mm -hmm. migraine, correct? Right. Okay. Right. So because it's we're not like, just, go ahead, please. Sorry. Sorry. So we're not just looking at the migraines themselves, right? We're looking at you know, other symptoms that they have, they're super tired all the time. Um, you know, when they, they're having GI issues, there's a lot of constipation and gas and bloating and GI discomfort. Um, so we're looking at, you know, family history. So how are the, some of the genetics possibly involved? I mentioned blood pressure, right? So we're looking at all of these other symptoms that is our bodies are telling us there's something not right in this area. And we can kind of focus in and figure out, well, what is that? And how does that pertain to your migraines? And, you know, we're all interconnected. So as right. we get hormones and neurotransmitters and our genetic function, and then we make sure that we've got 
all the nutrients that our body needs to be healthy on board, then that's when we start seeing their body is actually starting to heal. And, you know, we start seeing much less symptoms, much less intense medications that stopped working long ago, start working for them again. And, you know, we just kind of see that progression until they go weeks or months without, without needing a trip tan for the first time in a decade, you know, things like wow. that. Yeah. Wow. So I'm, I'm going to mention some of the, uh, some keywords that you, uh, you mentioned throughout this interview, and I want you to uh, elaborate on them a little bit. You mentioned uh, inflammation. What, what is the role of inflammation in, in uh, causing a migraine? Yeah. So, so again, inflammation can increase how, uh, how sensitive we are to pain. Um, it changes how our immune system works. It changes how our, um, our blood sugar is when we're under chronic inflammation, our cortisol level uh, rise, which then we also know when there's inappropriate cortisol release, then we've got how that impacts again, our immune system, our blood sugar levels, hormones, uh, and it also affects our neurotransmitters negatively as well. It suppresses our um, calming, you know, GABA serotonin, it suppresses those neurotransmitters and it elevates our stress neurotransmitters like epinephrine, norepinephrine, which again, we know is a trigger for migraines. So we see um, inflammation kind of, and then the, and then of course there's the CGRP pathways, which we know as well as involved in inflammation. There's a lot of medications that are coming out now in the CGRP class um, that can be effective for a lot of people. And so, you know, we definitely know that there is a component of inflammation. Where is it coming from is the question though. Is it from diet? Is it from hormone imbalance? Is it from stress? And so that's, again, trying to figure out what's the, that underlying piece that's causing all that inflammation in the first place. Now, do you find, uh, thank you for that, by the way, do you find that maybe uh, elimination uh, can contribute to migraines uh, by elimination. I mean, things like getting rid of some of the toxin waste in the body, whether it's through sweating, uh, you know, cause we're constantly putting chemicals and toxins, whether we're doing it through food or through drinks or smoking or through deodorant use, we're constantly putting uh, toxins on our skin, which ultimately gets into our body. Um, and so when I, when I say elimination, I'm, I'm referring to either you know, cleansing, either sweating, uh, or even using the bathroom, uh, and, and getting rid of it from, from your uh, system. Do you find that that can actually help with migraines? Yes, very much so. So that's a piece of what we do with all of our clients clients is really making sure that the detoxification pathways are working well. Uh, there's a very interesting study that came out, I want to say in 2013 or 14, that showed that people with chronic migraines, 92% um, of them were deficient in their major antioxidant glutathione, which helps mm. us to detoxify and get rid of all of those things. So when we don't have the, the nutrients or the, the, the chemicals in our, the good chemicals in our body that help us get rid of the bad chemicals, then we see those toxins, you know, floating around and again, causing inflammation. So, um, so that can be, that's a huge piece is really, you know, and we, and we take all of our clients through a safe detox path or detox protocol. Mm -hmm. Um, and what I mean by that is we have to make sure that we have built up their, their nutrients and their glutathione pathways to make sure that they can handle detoxification because I've seen, unfortunately too often, um, people, they think that detoxing is good, which it is. But in people who are already so depleted, which most people with chronic migraine are already, mm -hmm. um, then they go in and they try to detox. They just worsen themselves because their body doesn't have the ability to handle that extra release of toxins and get it out appropriately. So, so usually we do it with herbs and some other things, maybe some gentle fasting. Um, and then after they've you know built those things up, then they can move into some of the more intense things like the sweating and the sauna use, um, and those kinds of things, which again is fantastic, but I just want to make sure anybody watching be able to handle that. So you don't worsen your symptoms. Sure thing. Thank you. Yeah. What about water increasing hydration? So uh, I know a lot of people don't, don't drink enough water, um, yep. but what, what would you say about that? 
yeah, that's one of the very first things we do in week one is start tracking our water and how much are we getting. Um, but the, the key thing with people with migraines is that it's not necessarily just the water, uh, mm -hmm. because our electrolytes are often imbalanced. We, okay. you know, we don't have enough electrolytes in our body. And so you can drink all the water in the world, but if your body, if your cells can't actually get the water and you just end up peeing it out, you're still not hydrated, even though you're drinking a gallon of water a day, mm -hmm. which I wouldn't recommend that much by the way. But, you know, some people have come to me and they're like, I'm drinking a gallon of water a day. And I always feel thirsty uh, the minute that we add some electrolytes into their water, their body starts to actually absorb the water and they can drink half the water and feel like they're well hydrated, which yeah. is usually the case. And that can make a huge difference. So from a practical standpoint, that's one of the first things we do is we introduce the idea of electrolyte rich waters. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I also want to touch base on, you know, what role, if any, the gut has to uh, plays on on migraine. So I know that most of the immune system is uh, found in our gut. And so uh, what can you say regarding the, the role of, you know, probiotics, um, you know, our gut health, uh, and its relationship to the development of migraines? Huge, so huge. Um, way bigger, I think, than we ever knew about before. So there's the, the gut brain axis, the gut brain connection, mm -hmm. uh, where we're actually learning that the gut is actually a second brain in the body and is actually controlling a lot of, you know, the, the physiology of our body and how it's working. Um, 95% of serotonin is around the gut and is made by the gut. And uh, again, when we're looking at a, a major piece, serotonin deficiency is a major piece or drops, I should say is a major trigger for a lot of people with migraines. When we look at that serotonin deficiency, where's it coming from? The first thing we look at is, is there inflammation or something disrupting that process in the gut? Um, that I own that is not uh, healthy, it's not where it needs to be, then we end up seeing that we don't get, you know, our, our, the good back um, and, and making estrogen available. So it both breaks down and helps us to, to be able to use it. Um, and so there's antibiotics in not only in medicine, but in our food, and we're exposed to it in a lot of different places, um, roundup and things like that, that Role for sure. And so, you know, again, it, it's, it's a very key piece that we look at addressing is what's your gut health, like, you know, across the board, everybody goes through a kind of an evaluation, a self-evaluation, how's their gut functioning? Are they going to the bathroom as often as they should? Is it easy to pass? Um, and then, you know, not only that, but then how do they feel after they eat? Does food just sit in their stomach? Um, if they're not ever hungry, that can be another sign that there's some things not going on well. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then we kind of look at, you know, not only digestion, but then also how our body is able to turn our digestion on. So everybody's heard of fight or flight, mm -hmm. and then there's also rest and digest. And, um, we get stuck in fight or flight and people with chronic migraines tend to be stuck in that fight or flight mode. And we don't digest well when we're in that mode, sure. we need to learn how to turn on our parasympathetic system, our rest and digest system in order for us to be able to properly digest our food, mm -hmm. which if we don't have properly digested food, we're not absorbing the nutrients that we need to stay healthy. And that also causes, you know, undigested food particles also cause inflammation in the gut based on the, the other bacteria that's in there that is breaking things down inappropriately and causing gas and discomfort and cramping and all that other kinds of stuff. So it, it plays a huge role in, in neurology or in our, our migraines for sure. Wow. And so in, in your experience, is there a particular diet um, that has proven to be most helpful, um, you know, for those suffering from migraine? Yeah, that's, that's a really, really great question. Um, and I'm glad that you brought it up because there's a couple things that I really like to talk about diet. Um, one is yes, generally speaking, we want to see a whole foods anti-inflammatory diet. Doesn't mean it has to be anti -hist or low histamine or low tyramine, anything like that. Sometimes that can be helpful for certain people, but just across the board, we want a whole foods diet, which basically means very, very little, if any processed foods, like mm -hmm. your food should look like how it looks like in nature, right? Um, not in the yes. form of crackers, but in the form of the grains that you then make yourself. Right. And of course it's, you know, you've got to balance time and, you know, the ability to eat, but, um, we definitely want to make sure that we're, we're doing that. We're avoiding a lot of the foods that we know are triggers 
for migraines. So dairy and gluten are two of the biggies that are, there's, there's some research suggestion suggesting that those two are actually problematic. And a lot of people do really well in eliminating those. Mm -hmm. Um, but then there are some other inflammatory foods, corn, for example. Um, uh, the last time I saw a study on even organic corn, a hundred percent of it was contaminated with GMO. So yeah, yeah. our corn source. Yeah. And same with soy. So corn and soy now are not awesome food options for people just in general, but especially for people with a chronic illness. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and then we look at some other things that can be potentially inflammatory. Um, you know, we want to make sure it's grass fed free range meats and, and eggs and things like that. Eggs can be problematic for some people. So we just kind of look at doing kind of a slow, um, I don't like to call it an elimination diet. I like to call it a, 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 a diet switch where we're switching away from gluten grains and we're going towards the non-gluten grains. Um, and, and working on that piece. But one of the things that I really find um, extremely important to talk about um, with people with migraines is you identify a food that you think triggers or you know triggers you and you eliminate it. And I end up seeing that happening as you're kind of moving through life and you're figuring out, oh, well, bananas seem like they're triggering me. And then whenever I eat beans, I feel like I get a migraine and then I can't eat, you know, peppers. And suddenly I'm talking to somebody who feels like they get a migraine if they eat anything besides chicken and rice. <laughs> and when we're eating wow. such a restricted diet, we're not getting the nutrients that our body needs to be healthy and in balance. So right. we're still, and that's where we end up seeing the slow progression of eliminate, 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 eliminate. And suddenly now we're malnourished and we still don't feel very good, even though, you know what I'm saying? So it can yes, be really yes. tricky. So the key is to make sure sure that you are getting enough nutrients from your diet. And if you can't do it with diet, then supplemental in the short term supplements can be helpful, but we really want to work on healing the gut up so that you can reintroduce those foods. And we can actually successfully reintroduce. I'm, I'm a perfect example of that. I went on a fairly strict, I did the, the autoimmune protocol diet. So mm -hmm. it was all grain, you know, grain free, um, you know, very anti-inflammatory, but pretty restrictive. And because all of those things would trigger me and now I can eat tomatoes and tomato sauce and I can have a little bit of gluten every now and then, and I can eat dairy almost daily and not have any problems because I really worked on healing up my gut. So we can reintroduce those foods that used to be major triggers. Mm -hmm. Um, but we have to do the work of actual healing the gut and not just the elimination part. That's where people stop and they stop too soon. Thank you for enlightening us. Thank you so much for that. Um, what about the role of uh, physical activity, exercise? Because I know uh, millions of Americans live a uh, largely sedentary lives, um, considering we spend a lot of time sitting down on our couch at home or sitting at our desk at work or sitting in school for those of us that are still young. And so, uh, you know, this sedentary lifestyle is almost, uh, from what I last read, it's actually um, they'll likely consider it a chronic disease itself because of the effects, the negative effects it has on the body. Uh, what's the importance of physical exercise for someone suffering migraine? It's, it's really important. Um, but that it's kind of a, a catch catch 22, right? Because a lot of people, when they exercise, it can trigger a migraine for them. And so then they become scared of exercise. So exercise doesn't have to mean you're lifting, you know, 50 pound weights and you're running a mile a day. Mm -hmm. Exercise can literally mean you go for a leisurely stroll outside in the sunshine for 30 minutes. Sure. Um, or if you can't handle sunshine, then you go out during the rainy season, you know, whatever, but you just want to get ideally outside. Um, there is a lot of research that shows that uh, time in nature, time outside, even if you live in the middle of a city, still time outside is better than time indoors mm -hmm. uh, and the sunshine on our skin and just getting some fresh air can actually uh, really change. Our, it lowers our cortisol levels. It um, helps to boost our serotonin and GABA levels. It helps to reduce epinephrine, norepinephrine levels, which are our stress neurotransmitters. Um, and all those have a very positive effect on inflammation and hormone balance and sleep. Um, and the movement itself is just very very important for blood flow, for detoxification, for elimination from a GI standpoint, uh, all of those, like our body relies on movement to help with our circulation and detoxification. And so when we're just sitting there, um, our veins don't have any, it, it doesn't, 
they have valves there that, that only work. It helps to pump when we move our muscles, our muscles are actually our pumps for our, our veins to move our blood. And so if we're not moving, then all that blood is just sitting there and kind of very sluggishly moving forward. Mm -hmm. So we want to get up and, and move that around. So our circulation is improved. Our cells are getting the nutrients that they need delivered oxygen being delivered to our muscles. I mean, muscle tension and chronic muscle tension is a huge factor for a lot of people with migraine. Um, and so movement can actually help to reduce that. And plus it helps to reduce stress levels, just yeah. getting out and moving away from your desk, enjoying some fresh air. So yeah, even if you can't exercise in the way that we typically think of exercise, gentle stretching, um, migraine, safe yoga poses and walking outside for, you know, 15 to 30 minutes every day can, can make a world of difference. Indeed. And, and you mentioned stress. Stress seems to rear its ugly head on almost every chronic right. disease that uh, I talk about. And so what can you tell us with regards to the impact stress has on triggering migraines? So this is where I like to kind of come back to the biochemistry a little bit more mm -hmm. and looking at, okay, so great. What does stress mean? What releases cortisol, which is one of our, it's, it's a, I, it's a fight or flight, um, hormone, right? It helps us mm -hmm. to become much more alert, but we also get a healthy dose of it first thing in the morning to help us wake up. Well, a lot of women that I see, um, with chronic migraines, their cortisol level is kind of flatlined. It's low, normal, or frankly low, um, through the day. They don't have that nice spike in the morning. And then it, it you know, it slowly kind of tapers off through the rest of the day. And so that can be problematic because when we're under chronic stress and our body no longer has the ability to put cortisol out appropriately, then we end up seeing that that lack of cortisol, since we know cortisol drops will trigger a migraine it's well studied. Um, if we don't even have any, my, any enough cortisol just to be a normal baseline level, then we end up seeing that contributes to that migraine picture. And I've actually had several women that we've actually had to prescribe some low dose hydrocortisone, which is a type of steroid, um, but very low dose subphysiologic levels. Um, and just that little bit of medication overnight took their migraines away, daily migraines to none at all for months on end. And it was just the lack of cortisol that they had because they lived a life of chronic stress up to the point that they got sick. And then they didn't even have enough oomph to just feel good just in general. So that's one piece. Um, and when we look at a migraine, that's kind of the letdown migraine. So when, you know, your migraines start towards the end of the day at work, or when you get home and you are finally able to relax and that's when the migraine hits, we know, okay, your cortisol level have been too high during the day because of stress. And then when you get home and you're able to just relax, that's when it hits you because your cortisol is dropping. Mm -hmm. So really being aware of physiologically how that, that cortisol is playing a role is very key in helping to manage migraines, especially, you know, given the time of day can really point where in that, in that uh, cortisol cycle, is there a problem? The other really big piece about stress and migraines is um, our epinephrine or epinephrine. So these are our catecholamine neurotransmitters. Mm -hmm. And we also know that sudden elevations or sudden withdrawals of that, uh, that those neurotransmitters can also trigger a migraine. So we can see this when, you know, you get into a fight with your, your husband or wife and almost immediately you feel a migraine coming on. That's most likely a result of this epinephrine or epinephrine spiking. So again, that acute situation where migraine hits immediately during a stressful event, um, then we know, okay, we've got an issue with how your body is able to, you know, put this out and process it. So then not only do we have to avoid those situations or work on calming our bodies you know, sudden fight or flight response, but we also need to help support those pathways. So it's a little bit more balanced. And there's a lot of things that we can do from genetics to, you know, some of the neurotransmitters, some, um, some of the, um, nutrients that we can do to support how our body kind of keeps it around or, you know, breaks it down. Um, so there's things that we can do to help balance that as well. But again, it all comes back to stress and, and being exposed to chronic stress and acute stress and how our body behaves as a result of that. Very enlightening. Thank you so much, Dr. Painter. Um, for those of us who are new to your methods, the migraine mastery method, how can we get in touch with you 
um, and certainly uh, and, and possibly enroll in this 12 week program. So the, um, you can find more information at migrainemastery.org. I also have uh, a free Facebook group called Migraine Mastery and my, um, and my Migraine Support Group. And I also have a YouTube channel called Migraine Mastery and Migraine Free Life. So um, then that just, I get on and do 10 to 15 minute videos on some of these things that we've talked about. Uh, we didn't really touch too much on the hormonal piece, but there's a lot uh, on there uh, about hormones and such. So, um, so that that's all ways that you can get some really good uh, information from kind of this whole body approach. And then um, I also have a kind of a mini ebook about the, I call it the five things every chronic migraineer should know. And these are the things from hormones to thyroid to, you know, getting proper labs requested, um, you know, all the things that you should really take a very close look at when you're first kind of on this migraine journey to help you kind of hone in on some of the things that might be going on for you. Then I'm happy to offer that to your, to your audience as well. Thank you so much. And we're going to make sure we include the links to all of your social media uh, uh, platform, social media channels, as well as the uh, ebook. Uh, so anybody who watches this interview will have access to those things. And so I wanna thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy day and joining us today. Um, I truly enjoyed this interview. Um, even as a healthcare professional, it's always a pleasure to hear uh, a different perspective uh, than what we've typically been told because I have relatives that um, as you mentioned, that have suffered with migraines for years and, uh, you know, taking the trip tans, again, it's symptomatic relief, but it, it never quite addresses the root cause of their symptoms. So I will be sharing uh, your information with them. And, um, you know, as far as your program and everything, I'll certainly be uh, sharing that information with them. So uh, do you have any last words? No, I just, uh, I always like to, to end my last words are, are always, if you're watching and or listening and you struggle with chronic migraines and you feel like you're at the end of your rope, there is actually stuff that you can still do. Um, it's, it's not just, you've tried all the medications and the gadgets. There's actually, right. you know, ways that we can approach and figure out for you specifically what's going on. So I just like to end with a little note of hope there, because I know how hopeless that journey can feel. I've, I've been there. Thank you so much, Dr. Tanya Painter. Listen to the audio version of the Self-Care Forum podcast on Spotify, Apple, and Google Podcasts.